Thank you very much. Um, actually, uh, here is another apology. Uh, during the time after I submitted this talk, I considerably revised it. Can you hear me well? Okay. Do you want to take this off or what? Shall we? What's up? This is Baya. So I considerably revised it. Uh, so perhaps I should give it a subtitle. Uh, I don't think this is the end of physics. And the way I, uh, the reason I say that is that Lev told me at least in private, and perhaps he may uh, uh, assert this or has already asserted this during this conference that the many worlds interpretation is so good and so satisfactory that actually there is little uh, left in physics. Am I, am, I, am I misquoting? Oh, so that's it, okay. So with this, I am taking an exception. And here it goes. I've never been a fan of the many worlds interpretation. But some 30 years ago, actually exactly 30 years ago, I've been fortunate to meet a very brilliant physicist. At that time, he was young. I was young, too. And together, we collaborated on something which is known today, after 30 years, as the elitzur weidmann bomb testing experiment. We quarreled a lot since that time about all kinds of issues. But it is through this. And this is why I was so lucky. Lev and I collaborated on this. Was it because it, it was a good idea? I think so. Was it because he liked me? I'm not sure. But uh, he thought, and he still thinks, that the uh, bone testing experiment is one of the best, uh, is, is a very good expression uh, or a very good test to the validity of the many worlds interpretation. So this, is, this was very fortunate. And then during all those years in which we argued and, and quarreled and so on, I had to pay attention to this. Uh, uh, to this interpretation, sometimes be struck by its beauty, although I was never, uh, although I was never convinced. And here is an opportunity to uh, open a dia uh, to main, uh, make a dialogue with him. So you probably know. Here is the story. You place a bomb, super sensitive bomb. This is the version which I like most. Uh, it is not that the bomb is blocking the the, the photon, but it is enough that one of the mirrors gets a kick. Uh, to, to detonate the bomb, and it's enough that the mirror that can move does not move to make the photon emerge to the, to the left side detector, and then we are sure that the bomb is good. And there are many questions, how could this be? I would call them philosophically, I would say that there are two main approaches to explain this in philosophy. One is no ontology, take, and the other is ex excess ontology. So in uh, in no ontology, we will take Copenhagen and other views like this, which say that physics actually doesn't tell you what is reality, but physics tells you what you can say about reality. So it is just knowledge. The bomb did not explode. You know that the bomb did not explode. It's an epistemic fact. That's enough to explain the, the strange fact that although the photon could not pass uh, through this left, uh, left path, uh, left path uh, it left a kind of, it left a, a trace, a causal trace in the photon emerging uh, to the, to the uh, wrong detector. On the excess ontology would be Bohmian mechanics and of course the many, the many worlds. So I would say the following that uh, according to Lev, uh, just at the moment that the bomb did not explode there are already two levs, that is, two worlds in which there are two levs. And if the bomb does not destroy the, the laboratory and you can proceed uh, with this, then by the time that it emerges and the left side detector clicks, then you have now four levs, four universes, and so on and so on. And with this, I was never convinced. Uh, again, in uh, alternative to these uh, philosophies, some 10 years ago, Eliyahu Cohen and myself proposed a physical solution. I believe that this is a solution to what is actually happening in the bomb testing experiment. It does not resolve the mystery, as I will show, but it takes us to a place where you don't have to lean on, on any philosophy. This is what we call the quantum oblivion. I will describe it very, very shortly because it's a very clear paper which, is, which you can find. We followed Hardy and proposed the case and a, a, a thought experiment in which two uh, superposed particles make measure one another, the position of one another. So they make interaction-free measurement on one another according to, in the following way. 
in order to make it interesting, so I have here a particle and antiparticle, electron and uh, positron, and they are, uh, just like in, in the Mach-Zender interferometer, they are, they are split. But they are split in such a way that the left part of the electron crosses the two parts of the positron, and don't mind the technicalities, we arrange it such that if they ever meet, then there will be an annihilation. Okay, so here are the two wave functions. There could be an annihilation in this case, there could be a, a, another annihilation in the second meeting, but if, the, and then of course they will emit uh, some, uh, they, they will emit photons, that will happen in half of the cases. But what, in the, what happens in the other half of the cases? Well, something very interesting. If the two detectors do not click, they did not register a photon, so there was no annihilation, you have something interesting. The two interactions, the two annihilations did not take place. What do you have? You see that the uh, uh, electron has collapsed, that it, it is now, it has been disturbed, it is only on the right side while the positron remains oblivious of what happened. It has returned to its uh, original superposition. I'm talking physics here. If you try to time reverse them, then the positron would be completely time reversed. You see it will go back to its source, whereas the electron sometimes go through the beam splitter to another, to, to another place. So momentum has changed in one particle, not changed in the other particle, in apparent contradiction to Newton's third law. Here you have an inter uh, interaction and one of them is, is changed, the momentum is changed, and in the other it does not. What is happening here? The, we can explain that through the uncertainty principle. I urge you to, 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 read, uh, to read the paper. The interesting thing is that you see here two detectors which did not register a photon. This is a step further than the IFM. It is not that the photon did not go on this path. The photon was never emitted. The detectors never registered the photon. And still, the electron has changed its momentum. It, it, it changes, it, it, it has collapsed, while the, the positron never changes. We can show that there was a time in which they were entangled, and then there was an unentanglement, not disentanglement, unentanglement in the sense that something is being reversed. So this, I think, shows something very interesting about quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a, is a physics, is a branch of physics dealing with the smallest amounts of energy and, and matter where events can happen and then unhappen. Unoccur. Nature can sometimes reverse its course and annul and undo uh, and undo some interactions. And this this explains how come that the positron is oblivious of what happens. Although if we catch it in the middle, we can see that it has been entangled briefly with with the uh, with the with, with the electron. Have we resolved? And then we argued that what happens in the IFM is something very similar, and this is just physics. You can show that in order for the sensor of the bomb, or the mirror in this case, to have a clear momentum that is zero before and after, it must be smeared, it must have an uncertain position. So something similar happens in that the photon, half of the photon meets that sensor, just like the positron, in many places, and then they perform kind of mutual uh, interaction free measurement on one another, and then the, the, uh, the sensor tells the photon, look, why don't we say that you, never, you have never been here, you have been always in the other place, and I return oblivious, and, and this is what happens in the bomb. Does it solve the mystery? I think that this is, I think that this is a major advance. It, it has to do with, uh, with uh, our one of bomb effect and in many other things. You could see that there is, it, the, the title is, is somewhat arrogant, a master key for many quantum riddles. I, I urge you to, to read the paper. Still, I don't think that we have resolved the mystery. You have here two interactions which could occur, two remote detectors which could register photons. They did not register any photon, and still one particle, that is the electron, is changing. How is it happening? I say that I was very fortunate to uh, meet Lev so, uh, some 30 years ago. Lev and I were very fortunate to have this master. And it is once again a testimony to Lev's uh, fertility, uh, or his kind of schizophrenia, where he can be a very loyal, many worlds person, and at the same time do all these brilliant works with Yakir Aronov along the uh, two-state vector formalism, and without feeling any contradiction for him, they, they go in harmony. I would like now to show this, uh, to treat the, the interaction-free measurement in terms of Aronov's uh, two-state vector formalism. And I would say the following, and here is a brief introduction. What is so, annoying about quantum mechanics. Simple, 
you have, you have a photon going through a beam splitter, and then you have two detectors. You don't know which of them will click. And it is not that it goes one way and not the other. We know that if we make a mach zender interferometer, then we can prove that it was in both cases. This is where I am struck by the beauty of the many worlds, because Lev actually says, you see, here is the beginning of a universe being split, and we avoid it, and we just return it. But here is a kind of, of proof, or if you want evidence, that the many worlds interpretation is correct. But here is a problem. There's only one of them, and I don't know which of them will click. How should I call the other history? There is one future which materializes. I don't know what. How should I call the other, uh, the other future? We had a president, uh, the earlier president of the United States, who enriched our language with something very beautiful, fake. So may I call it fake future? There is a real future and fake future. But the genius of Trump is nothing compared to the genius of Arono, because Arono says, now when you run it backwards, this fake future is a problem in quantum mechanics, because it's not there. It doesn't happen, but the interaction free measurement tells you that even such a fake future can have causal effects. But now, along comes Arono and say, run it backwards. And if you run it backwards, you get also a fake past. I mean, or if you really do want to run it, it doesn't always go to the source. Sometimes it go, can go to the sewage or to the refrigerator from which it never came. So you have a fake future, and now the TSVF brings a further problem in the form of a fake past. Why is it good? Why do we need this, uh, this, additional, this additional annoyance? Well, here it goes that in a history where there is fake future and fake past, if they overlap, if you take the right initial uh, pre-selection and post-selection, a real effect can happen in the overlap. And this is what I, I want to show. Uh, here you have, as you can see, one fake future. The bomb did not explode. In terms of the many worlds, there is another universe in which it has exploded. Now, what do you do with the pieces and so on? But it, it's a fake future. When you run it backwards, there is also a fake past. That is, that it, the photon came from the bomb, which is not true. But then, as you can see, here is a case in which the combination of the two tells you that the photon went only on one side, but in some strange way, uh, it has been affected by the presence of the bomb or by the, 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 the sensor of the bomb being uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this state. So here's one example, and I would like to take another one. You probably know about the three boxes paradox by Aronov. Now you split a particle not to two, but to three in, in a somewhat different way, and you pick a certain post selection. Then you can say something very strange, that the particle has, with certainty, existed, resided in one box. At the same time, it has certainly resisted in the, uh, uh, resided in the other box. And it has been in the third box in a kind of a negative presence. It is not that it is not there, but it is there in a kind of negative negative way. What do you do with this? It is, it's a simple matter of the algebra, which gives you this minus sign for the presence. I usually, Yakir is not here, so he won't, my, uh, he won't object. I usually compare this to what Dirac did some, m many decades ago when he encountered this strange plus uh, in the equation of the electron, and he dared to, uh, had the guts to say that this, that means that we can have a positive electron. And it turn, turned out to be correct. Uh, Yakir said, let's assign this minus sign. Uh, we cannot assign it to the charge. Let's assign it to the mass. You have a kind of negative particle. Very briefly, for a very brief time, you have it there. Uh, and can we prove it? Later came the case of the disappearing and reappearing particle, which we had the, uh, the honor of collaborating with Yakir, in which there was something even more interesting. Take such three, three boxes like that and then make the right post-selection, and now you have a very strange prediction. You have three boxes. At T1, you are sure, you are confident that it has resided in box one. At T2, should say perhaps A, B, C. At T2, it has certainly resided only in box three, which is remote from one and two. There is a possibility of passage between one and two. And at uh, T3, it uh, certainly resides in box two, which is, again, adjoined with box A. So here we have two boxes in which it certainly resides at a certain time. Certainly, they are empty at the next time, the same particle, and then uh, it resides there. How can you prove that? 
so here is just the, the ontology which, uh, which Haranov employs. Actually, you have this negative particle, negative ghost particle being in one of them, and such that when the nega particle and the particle are together, then it's not an annihilation, but they, for brief time, they seem not to exist such that the, the boxes are empty. As we know, there is always a problem, uh, how, do you, uh, how do you verify predictions of the TSVF? You can, make, you can make a measurement because you would ruin it. Here is, is, here is a trap. You make a measurement at the beginning, at the morning, you make a measurement at evening, and then you are assured that something very interesting happened at, at noon. But what you can do to prove it? You can't open the boxes at noon. It is only by that, that you later retrodict the, the, that this is what happened. We uh, joined two, uh, uh, two Japanese um, physicists to do something amazing, which Aronov and Lev did. I'm missing here, I believe. I'm missing here the, uh, the, the paper. But Aronov and, and uh, Weidmann showed that in some cases, you can make not a weak measurement, but a strong projective measurement in order to show that a particle is at two places at the same time. This is the famous shutter experiment in which you make a double slit experiment, and then you send a particle, a test particle to the two slits, and it is being reflected by both of them, and this has been even shown. This is what uh, Takeuchi, uh, Okamoto and Takeuchi did uh, not many years ago. Along came Lev and said, let's visualize it, just in terms of the interferometer. And here comes the, uh, the nested MZI, similar to the mach interferometer, with the difference that there is a smaller uh, uh, MZI in the middle. Now, what you do when you send a particle for this, uh, for this system, then you're going to get here where it goes. So here you have your fake future, you see? The detector D never clicks, so it didn't go there. It only detector D2 clicks, so there is only one trajectory which the, apparently the photon, the, the particle could follow. Now you run it backwards and you get the ridiculous fake past. Here you have these two fake futures. Now when you run it backwards, you have the fake past. It has taken the other trajectory from which, we, from which it didn't come back, and it has a strange history, a strange origin, which is completely ridiculous. Ridiculous again, but when you combine these two, let me skip the formalism, when you combine these two, you get something really, really strange. At the right-hand part, for a very brief time, there is a particle. The particle didn't go there. The particle didn't come back from there, but it was there. Can we prove it? Then Cohen and myself joined forces with Takeuchi and Okamoto and said, let's make an experiment. Now, with, with, uh, not with weak measurements, but with strong measurements, with projective measurements. And here is, a, oh, okay, here is the shutter experiment by Weidman and Haronov. So we combined all of them and we made a synthesis. I apologize for this uh, ridiculous uh, drawing of mine. There is a, a more professional one by uh, Okamoto and Takeuchi, but here it goes. Let's take another particle, a test particle, split it into three, four, five, not only in space, but also in time, just give them a delay. And then look what happens. The test particles tells you. Uh, so here is how we overcome the problem of, of verifying a TSVF. You make a measurement at the, uh, at the morning. This is the pre-selection. You make a measurement at the evening. This is the post-selection. What do you do at the noon, where the interesting things are happening? You can't make a measurement, because then it won't be between two measurements. So you can either make a weak measurement or do what Weidmann and Aronov did, take another particle, let it interact with it in a very subtle way, put it aside, get your post-selection at evening, and then come back to what happened at noon and inspect your particle. And this is what our test particle tells us. Either it went through this path, never found the photon there, never found the particle, it was reflected by a mirror back here. Either at noon it went here and it was it met a particle. It was bounced by a particle and came back. Or either it went through, uh, through uh, came to the, uh, inspected this part and didn't find a particle. Here we have something very interesting. Here we have a new ontology which tells you that for a very brief time, uh, negative mass exists between pre and post selection. What does that say about our universe? Are there many worlds? Perhaps. 
Lev is sure, many of you are, are sure that there is. What I want to call attention is that whether there are or there are not, in this world, there is a very interesting physics waiting to be explored. This is our paper, non-local position changes of photon reveal with uh, Okamoto and Takeuchi, and our results are going to come. Here is his talk, and let me finish only with this, uh, about which I'm alone. I don't think that even Haronov agrees with me. This is Lev's nested interferometer. This is our bomb testing experiment. Notice that here in the detector that tells us that this is fake future and the photon never went there, I could place a bomb. I strongly believe that we can generalize it. That is, that every time that there is an a, a interaction-free measurement and there is no click, but still that no click leaves traces Something along these lines has happened. There was an exchange of a particle and a nega particle. What you think that nothing has happened actually has happened. Now, people may say, and Lev may say, you can't prove the, this in, in, in the ordinary Mach Zender interferometer. It's a completely different mathematics. And then my argument will be uh, the following uh, The lights, the rays, the light rays coming from a distant star are bent by the sun. We can see it only in an eclipse. I have no doubt that it happens also when there is no eclipse. In other words, I am sure that although there is no way yet to generalize this ontology of the TSVF to a general physics which tells us what is a collapse and what is an interaction-free measurement, what is a negative result, something very exciting along the, these lines is happening. Here we have many papers uh, which we wrote uh, during this time. Thank you very much, Lev, for 30 years of very fruitful dialogue, and thank you all very much. Nathan Argaman, do you want to say something reciprocal? Your description uh, still distinguishes between you know, what's happening at this time, at noon, as if uh, what will happen later will not affect it? Or, so do you, do you think that retrocausality could perhaps help sure, explain this? Sure, sure. This is retrocausality. I have a problem with that, which I never resolved. I do believe in becoming. This is a question that I've been asking here. I rose up at morning from my bed. I was struggling on, on the way on the eye alone because I, I was late here. And later, I hope to be, to be back home. Is the previous Avshalom and the present Avshalom and the next and the future Avshalom, all of them coexist? I know that, um, Gizet, that uh, Nicolas Gizet believes in some kind of becoming. I also believe in some kind of becoming. At present, this has to do with philosophy. I'm interested to know whether many world's people also believe in that. But yes, most of our work with Cohen, with Aronov and all that involve retro causality. What I want to say is that the ordinary methods of uh, interpretation of retro causality, say Kramer and Rothkastner and so on, I, I, I wonder why they do not pay attention to, to these kind of experiments. Sorry for being too long. So let me say only this. There are many interpretations of quantum mechanics, many worlds and others. Something that is unique about the T TSVF, and here it is, it, derive, it gives you many, many predictions. Surprising. When you analyze them, you say, oh, sure, it, 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 also, it, it also accords with standard quantum formalism. Here is the fact. No other interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, Bohmian mechanics, uh, 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 many worlds and so on, None of them is so rich with new predictions as the TSVF. Does that mean that the TSVF is the best interpretation of quantum mechanics? I said that here is a very strong argument in its favor. It is only TSVF that surprises you, as Clev. And then after that, you say, oh, yeah, we could know that through, the, through one state vector formalism. Do you understand what I'm saying? And here, I think, is, is, is a very strong example to that. I just want to kind of investigate the rhetoric a little bit. You said, okay, here's no ontology, and I guess for certain purposes, no ontology is certainly not enough ontology. Um, 
if you want a physical account of the world, you've got to postulate something. Then you said, oh, here's too much ontology. Right? You had many worlds in Bohm. Uh, and then now you have some, you know, maybe retrocausal to state, whatever it is. It has some ontology. I don't quite understand how you're making these judgments. Um, you would agree that a Bohmian account of all these experiments, where there is a single particle and it follows some single track and there's no fake future that's doing anything, that all the causal stuff is being done by a quantum state and particles in accordance with well-defined differential equations and they'll give you all these predictions and you say, well, that's too much. Or, I, I mean, I, I, I kind of don't understand I was what, what, not, what, what is too much about that ontology? What is excessive I was about? not meaning any disrespect. Okay. No, but, no. but too much means there's something wrong with this. <laughs> no, no, no. I say only, you know, we, we know the problem. We heard, uh, say, in the, previous, in the previous talk, can you prove that other worlds exist? So here is it. Can you prove that a, 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 an empty wave exists? You remember VGA and all these people for many years asked whether you can prove that this kind of guide wave empty wave which actually would uh, contradict uh, the uncertainty principle and they gave up or perhaps some people did not. So I would say there is excess ontology with, uh, with a lot of respect. Let me say another thing. I think that they are very fruitful. Let me quote a PhD student of mine, Shahar Dolev, uh, who once I heard him analyzing a situation along the many worlds interpretation. I said, do you believe in many worlds? He said, no. But very often when you have a difficult problem in quantum mechanics, analyze it along the lines of many worlds, guide wave, and so on and so on. They are all very good. I still argue that the TSVF is the most fruitful one. I was not meaning any disrespect, not even to Copenhagen. It's beautiful. It's elegant. But, uh, but uh, yeah, this is where I'm, I'm so uh, if one's interested in ontology, then, a, then an approach that says, I'm simply not, I mean, I better not assert there's no ontology. That's really bad. You can say, I just don't care about ontology. If you're interested in ontology, that's not sure. a good thing to do. But let me just say, just very quickly, if someone were to say, look, of course there's evidence of, quote, empty waves, two, just plain old two-slit interference, right? Plain old two-slit interference tells us something or other is sensitive Fine. to whether both slits are open. Even interaction-free measurement, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, so it, it, sure. it's not like that you would say there's no evidence. I mean, if you're doing it in this theory, you say, of course there's evidence, just interference phenomena. That's why we come up with a theory like it this. It is just that every evidence in favor of the uh, guide wave of the Bohmian mechanics is just as good for many worlds interpretation and for Copenhagen. So it's not bad. All I'm claiming is that during all these years, one approach to quantum mechanics, one formalism, the two-state vector formalism, keeps surprising us with many, many new results that you can show. They are not against, they, they, they do not contradict uh, the quantum formalism. In retrospect, they all turn out to be in full agreement with it. I said that this is the most fruitful one. No disrespect to any of the others.